Welcome. You're just back from a tour of the, of the States, and I believe an interview with the President of the United States. Sir. Yes, I did have an audience with the uh, President. Um, he requested that I came, um, <laughs> and I did. <laughs> Beg your pardon. Um, <laughs> no, uh, I did actually go. <laughs> I went to see him, uh, and uh, to give him a bit of advice, you know. Uh -huh. And uh, he gave me a belt buckle, and he was very nice. And uh, I actually saw him on a day that... Uh, the whole Middle East uh, situation broke loose, uh, and it was, uh, he'd been up since six o'clock in the morning. It was a bit parallel to Maggie Thatcher, really, it, it, during the Argentinian crisis, sort of having tea with Cliff, you know, saying, I'm sorry about this, I've just got to have tea with Cliff Richard for ten minutes. Uh, so it was kind of a... Was he a fan? I don't really know if he's... Knew, knew, I don't know. It was, it was organised by somebody in the White House. I don't know if it was uh, propaganda about um, first rock star seen in White House with President Reagan. Um, I somehow, when I met him, I don't think he actually knew who I was. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, it's, it, all joking aside, it is a very great honour, you know, to, to be invited to the White House. Yes. Um, you must occasionally sort of pinch yourself when you think, I mean, you move among, in, in Britain, you're a friend of the, of the royals and you meet President Reagan, you've travelled all over the world. Do you ever sort of pinch yourself and wonder what happened to Reg Dwight? Yes, it's, uh, I know what happened to him. Um, <laughs> But it is, uh, I've done a lot of things that I never, ever in my life thought I would be able to do. Mm. I mean, or, you know, if I'd have taken bets as a kid that I would be dancing with the Queen at, uh, in, in, at Windsor Castle, I mean, the odds would have been staggering. Dancing with her? Yes, well, I did, you know. I played at uh, Prince Andrew's birthday party last year, um, 21st birthday party, which is probably one of the most frightening things I've ever done. Because you sit there, you go out on stage, and it's a beautiful room in Windsor Castle, and the whole of the royal family with her. And you, you see, the, you go on stage and you see these empty gold chairs and you think, oh, Christ. <laughs> um, uh, and afterwards, you know, we, um, we were invited to stay and have supper and, uh, you know, we danced and everything like that. I, I was able to meet Lady Diana. It was very nice, you know, I don't really like to talk about it too much because I don't, you know, I don't think they would like it very much. But I did actually dance with the Queen, you know. Mm. I danced with a man who danced with Did you do a bit of that, then? Uh, yes, I did jiggery pokery and stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> actually, I mean, we did dance to Rock Around the Clock. <laughs> Which was, I mean, I didn't think that was bad. Being coming from a council house in England and suddenly ending up by dancing with the Queen to rock around the clock. <laughs> it's not bad. It's, no. you know. what, how, how old were you, in fact, when you started playing piano? Um, I think I started, uh, my, my grandmother, I used to live in my grandmother's house because my father was in the Air Force and my mother um, used to stay with my grandmother. Um, so I was probably about three or four um, and I used to sit, there was always a piano in the house and my auntie played piano. And I think uh, my granny used to sit me on her knee and, uh, and I used to just pick it up. I just uh, started playing. And what were the sort of musical influences in those days on you? Um, on me? Well, I was always lucky because my mum and dad had um, a, a radiogram in the house. So I grew up, and I always hate to say this because it makes me sound so old, but it was like uh, Guy Mitchell, Frankie Lane, K-Star. In fact, my, my dad was a big fan of George Shearing, um, jazz pianist. So I grew up with them. Um, I was always lucky enough to have records around the house. My parents both collected records. And I, I grew up in that uh, golden age of dance band music, Billy May and stuff. What about the other kind of music? I mean, when did you discover that there was another kind of music which excited you? In the bath. Oh, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, one, my mother used to come uh, home every it's Friday night. She used to buy a record every week. And I remember her coming home one Friday and saying, I've just bought these two records. I've heard this new sort of music. And it was Heartbreak Hotel, Elvis Presley, and ABC Boogie by Bill Haley. And she put them on the radiogram. And um, I'd never heard anything like it as well. That was the first time I'd ever heard rock and roll. And I was immediately hooked. Was it at that moment that you decided you wanted to be a rock and roller? Not really. I just wanted to play. Um, I started to listen to Little Richard records and all the pia piano players who played rock and roll. All I wanted, I knew in my life, I, I had a goal in my life. I didn't know, I didn't want to be, become what I am. I mean, that all happened by accident. I just wanted to play piano or sell records in a record shop or be surrounded by music. And I found that was a great advantage when I was young to actually know what I wanted to do. Did your parents um, go along with this uh, ambition of yours? Um, well, my dad, my parents divorced. Um, my dad was always a bit anti what I do. Uh, I do and, uh, Why? Uh, basically, because he was a snob, really. Um, <laughs> uh, I don't know. He, he, um, I can't understand it. He came from a working glass background and played trumpet in a dance band. Um, Bob Miller and the Miller Men, in fact. Oh, yes, good band. Yes. Um, but, um, you know, when I was, my parents divorced when I was about 13, and my mother married my stepfather. 
And my father didn't really give me that much encouragement. Um, in fact, he was, he'd rather I worked in a bank or something like that. And my mother and my stepfather always gave me all the encouragement I needed. He's presumably changed his mind now. Not really. He's still a miserable sod. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> I take it there's no great love lost then. Between Not you really. And your father, no. I mean, no. I, I mean, I don't like to talk about him that much because no. I'm, you know, he has his own life to lead. What really did irk me is that the fact that he. I was one of the brother and sister when I grew up, ah, uh, and I was an only child, and he, you know, he didn't particularly like children very much, and when he got married, he had four kids in four years, four boys, and now, of course, I've made it. They've all got to be better than me, so they're sort of like, sat down, you will play the piano better than me. <laughs> um, but, uh, no, I've tried to patch things up with him, and it didn't quite work out, so that's, you know, I let bygones be bygones. But leaving that, that uh, the, he, what you think about uh, him apart, um, did it have an effect on you, your parents divorcing? I mean, did, you, what, did it isolate you? Did you feel very lonely? No, I wanted it to happen. The quicker the better, because, um, you know, the things were so, you know, it was so chaotic and so awful for my mother. And beside the fact that my mother was um, having an affair with the, the man that's now my stepfather, who treated me great, he let me have a drop handlebar bicycle, for example. <laughs> there was no chance that I was ever going to have a drop handlebar bicycle with my father. Forget it. <laughs> I, was still wearing, I still was wearing sandals and white socks. Um, so, no, I just wanted them to get over, uh, to, for it to happen as quickly as possible so that uh, um, my, you know, my mother could uh, marry my stepfather and I could have someone who actually t took an interest in me. When did you start moving toward the, 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 the rock and roll star image? I mean, when did that, that sort of happen for you? Well, I don't think I have a rock and roll star image. That's the most confusing thing about me. I mean, do you mean when I went solo and stuff like no, that? No, no. What, what I meant was, when did you, first of all, let's take your trademarks, for instance. I mean, let's say the glasses. I mean, yeah. did, have you always worn glasses? Yes, I wore glasses to start with because I, I couldn't quite see, I, I had a very minor, um, I don't know, I just couldn't see the blackboard very well, but it wasn't a major thing. And I, because of people like Bloody Shadows and Buddy Holly, who were very popular at that time, I wore black rimmed glasses and I thought it was fashionable and I wore them all the time. Henceforth, my, well, my eyesight got worse. And now uh, I have to wear them all the time, or contact lenses. And what about the clothes? When did you start dressing differently from, from other people? <laughs> <laughs> you know, when did people start looking at you, giving you uh, curious looks in the street and things? Um, Oh, when I used to stale and dress up in my mother's clothes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's the confession I want. Yeah. <laughs> no, um, well, not this is a teenage a teenager. Even my mother was pretty strict about what I wore. Um, uh, and I wasn't allow allowed to wear hush puppies and things like that, which is bloody ridiculous. I mean, hush puppies. But mods wore hush puppies in England. So it was strictly taboo. So when I actually became successful as Elton John, it was like sort of carry my teenage years onto my, into my 20s. I wore everything, I did everything that everyone said I couldn't do before. So um, I was always too portly to wear jeans, um, and I probably still am, um, but I, I was never allowed to do, never allowed to really to wear what I wanted. Um, and I was very, very uh, inferior, I had a big inferiority complex as a child. What very about? Introvert. Um, what about? About the fact that I had three legs. <laughs> 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 Can we have a close-up of Mr. John's third leg? <laughs> Can we have a magnifying glass? <laughs> God, it's hot in here. It is hot. Here. <laughs> but what was the inferiority complex about? I mean, just about you being 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 I, fat, I, were you, or what? No, no. It's probably because I was scared of my father, and I just, you know, I just, as, I was very introvert as a kid. Mm. Um, I never realised, uh, I look back on my career and try and analyse sections after my career. And I used to play in a band and we were backing Long John Baldry, who was a singer in England. And at that time he was playing cabaret. And I left the band, I never had, and I look back and think, how come you had the courage to leave the band? Because I would never say boo to a goose. It's just that I would not play to people that were eating while I played. I just, that, for me, that's the, the death of a musician. It's just awful. Right. And I just, I don't re recall how I actually had the courage to do that. Um, and I, you know, I gradually got out of it, but I had it in, so an inferiority complex, maybe that's unfair, but I was, you know, I was, I never really, I was afraid, I never ha really had my own identity, I, I don't know. What was your mum's attitude toward the, the, the more outrageous of your, of your clothes? I mean, um, well, there were certain times when Bernie and I first, Bernie Torp and I first got together as songwriters, um, when the Beatles, when the Carnaby Street happened, and there was all the Beatles, the old uh, soldiers' uniforms and the old overcoats, and we would get something from a jumble sale for like, for ten bob or something. And she would not walk on the same side of the street. <laughs> no way. Totally she would disown me. I mean, I would run and she'd run as well.